pressure. Yes. Welcome everyone. New edition of the Gemini North Talks. Today we have the pleasure to have here Alejandra Irupe Fresco from University of Milano Bicocca from Italy. So she's still a little bit jet lag because it takes a while, but she's going to do her best to stay awake during her talk and you should stay awake as well. <laughs> I suggested. Uh, Alejandra did, she come from Paraguay. She have a interesting master thesis career where she jump around between different countries and different uh, program doing engineering, then astronomy and physics and doing different things until she landed at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in uh, Garshin in Germany, where she got her PhD about a year ago, no? Yeah, less than a year ago, actually. Less than a year ago. And now uh, she got a, a postdoc position at the University of Milano Bicocca, where she's worked now, and she's now visiting for a week-ish. She's going to stay here on in the office until Friday, and then she takes some good time, a little bit. There is a good weekend, hopefully <laughs> it is not raining. And we'll talk uh, today about on the search for the missing variant. So let's start. Okay. Thank you, Emma, for your introduction. Okay, so as you said, I come from Paraguay, and I want to give a little like background on um on Paraguay, of course, because most people don't really know where it is or, you know, well, basically anything about Paraguay. And I think it's like very important for me, of course, to like mention a little. Um, so we are like right in the heart of South America. Um, this is our flag, the front, and the back actually has a lion, which is weird because we don't have lions. We actually have jaguars, which would be super cool if they actually put it on the flag as well. But for some reason, but we don't. Uh, we're about 6 million people. Um, R&D is very low, one of the lowest in the entire region. Actually, it's only like 0 0.12 of the GDP. And we're bilingual. We speak Spanish and Guarani. So actually, my name, Alejandra, is in Spanish and Irupe is in uh, Guarani. It's a flower. And uh, yeah, we, ha we have no astronomy as career option. So we only have physics at one, at one university. And then... We have no masters, no PhDs uh, or anything. Uh, so we had, basically I had to leave the country, uh, but yeah, like I, I hope eventually um, we might have some astronomy in the country, but I'm not the first one. Uh, there's uh, this person called Alexis Troche and uh, he founded the Astronomical Observatory from Asuncion, which is the capital of Paraguay in the National University, which is a public university from Paraguay. That's not the observatory that we're, that's not the telescope, actually. Um, so uh, this is the telescope. <laughs> um, he had a master's degree in physics and he was an honorary member of the IAU. And he, well, was the first one to, you know, promote astronomy in the country. And he is a pretty big deal uh, back home. And as you can see here, the uh, telescope is mostly used for outreach nowadays because it's in the middle of the city. It's a 45 centimeter Cassegrain telescope with a UVB uh, photometric filter. And if you guys have any idea of what I can do with that, um, please, I'm all ears because, well, besides doing some outreach, of course, there's not much I can do with that right now. Um, yeah, and, and then it's me so far. Um, and his first paper was in 2000 and he actually died shortly after. So he has around five papers in total. That's astronomy in Paraguay. We also have a planetarium. This person is called Blaser Bin. He was basically my mentor. He pushed me into following my dreams of astronomy. Although of course I like, didn't have it. He was like, no, like there are so many options. You can get scholarships. You can, you know, just basically just leave the country, which I did. And um, yeah, he, does, he did a lot of public outreach as well. And um, he did some Guarani astronomy. So he, the, the little research that he did, there's nothing actually published, uh, was mostly about indigenous astronomy. And you can see here, this is what the Guaranese, the indigenous people called the moon eclipse, which is basically a jaguar eating the moon. And that's what it's like, a moon eclipse is actually called jaguar eating the moon. <laughs> And yeah, I think this is really nice. So current work in the area of physics, we do have some five PhDs working in um, um, particle physics in Paraguay. They are at the National University um, as well. 
and they work primarily with CERN and Fermilab. And actually, Jorge Molina is like one of them that actually like recently won an award for most citations. Well, in Paraguay, which is not much to say, but still, he's um, a very good person as well. He told me, if you ever want to come back to Paraguay, since there's no astronomy and not a lot of opportunities, you can always come and do some particle physics with me, which I think is really nice. Um, so we do have a space agency. It opened around the same time I started doing my master's in astrophysics. So I'm like in, very much in contact with them. Um, this is their, <laughs> their operations center, they call it. And they launched one nanosatellite so far, which is called Guarani Sat. And they built it in cooperation with Japan. So basically two, okay, so like um, two students uh, that ended engineering went to Japan for masters and uh, PhDs, the, those are them, and basically built a nanosatellite in Japan uh, and then came back and, um, and managed to launch it from the ISS. And the idea of the first nanosatellite was to mm, do some real, uh, real time data collection of these vectors of a disease called Chagas, which is a huge deal like in South America. And, um, Basically, they put like these little traps in the houses that were like, um, how do you say, in, in danger of getting these insects inside through some crevices in the walls. And at the time that the insect would enter the trap, they would send instantaneous data to the nanosatellite. But basically, <laughs> that's all I know because I asked them, where's the documentation? Is there any like anything written down where I could read more or about the satellite construction or the research behind it? And they're like, yeah, no. So basically this was a six months project and um, it ended and there are no results, nothing. And they already want to build the second one. And the thing is that this is the big thing for the government mostly, right? Saying like, hey, we launched our first satellites. Although it's like nano satellite, like they're very proud of it. and. Um, yeah, it helps them with their propaganda, I guess I could call it that. <laughs> so although there's no astronomy in the country, there were so many groups of astronomy that started popping up all over the country, basically, mostly from students. And this is like only half of them. And then we also had the Paraguayan Olympics for astronomy and astrophysics, also for high school students. And I mean, I hope that this means that eventually we will have like, you know, more interest um, on actually having the career of astronomy. Because I have met with the rect uh, the dean of the, univers the National University and the uh, director of the career of physics. And I asked them, hey, I'm doing this. What's the, what's the plan for the future? Is there anything coming up like five, 10 years from now? And they were all like, no. But how can they keep saying no and that there's no interest when we already have students that are winning in the Latin American Olympics, like gold medals and stuff. So I think it's really, uh, it's it's there. It's going to happen eventually. Okay, so I do a lot of public outreach as well, but mostly like online because of course, like I'm not there, but uh, I like public outreach a lot. And <clears throat> also, of course, if you have any ideas about public outreach, please, um, I'm all oh, ears. <laughs> Okay, so again, as Emma mentioned, I did my PhD at the Max Planck of Extraterrestrial Physics. I was working mostly with Andrea Merloni, who is um, the PI of the Eurosita X-ray satellite, although I didn't do any X-rays. And then Celine Peru, uh, she's from ESO and she works on uh, CGM, mostly. Okay, so we know the universe composition, right? Um, I'm just gonna go briefly over this. And that the ordinary matter, ordinary matter, it's only 4% of the total uh, universe budget. We have 73% of dark energy and 23% of dark matter. And of that 4%, we have stars and galaxies, cold gas in galaxies, hot gas in galaxies. And then we also have um, diffuse gas, cold intergalactic gas, warm intergalactic gas, and hot intergalactic gas. And basically, I focused on this ones that are very diffuse to be detected in emission, basically. And for my first part, I'm gonna talk about these two. So warm, hot, intergalactic um, gas. Okay, so uh, we know from simulations how the cosmic web looks like already in early 2000s. 
And of course, this gave us an idea of how the whole galaxies and groups of galaxies and clusters are connected to each other and how they actually can, um, you know, get uh, some mass and momentum for their growth and how can they expel it back and basically, you know, the whole baryon cycle and how it actually works. So massive momentum accretions through the IGM, an intergalactic medium, that makes the galaxy grow. And then again, this um, expulsion of uh, outflows of uh, the mass and momentum through AGNs and supernovae. And the questions, of course, uh, considering the baryon budget that I just mentioned, are where are these like diffuse baryons that are supposed to be connecting all the galaxies to each other? And what are the physical conditions around um, the galaxies and the galaxy clusters? So, of course, I just you, showed you a very basic image of how everything is supposed to work, but we know it's a lot more complicated than just like, oh, inflows and outflows and like a one uh, filament coming in and out. And uh, yeah, just showing like, this is also like a very well-known image. I'm pretty sure you've all seen it as well, is how the diffuse gas is just like, all over the galaxy and it's like really hard to disentangle which is which in the end. Uh, right, so uh, what I did for my study of this very diffuse gas is using, of course, quasars as a background source and try to detect this um, very diffuse gas in emission through, uh, in, emission, in absorption. And um, right, so uh, the, the, again, the same image of the large scale structure of the universe showed us what's the location of this like filaments and knots of the cosmic web and uh, a per, an approximate temperature and range, right? So remember, this is like already at the beginning of my PhD, so 2018. And the temperature range showed by the simulations was 10 to 7 Kelvin. So it was supposed to be found in x-rays, right? So we were like, okay, what are the possible detection mechanisms that we have? could be X-ray in emission or absorption or um, using quasars and blazars or CMB as a background source or using the Sunyaev Seldovich effect. And then we had the first detection of a filament of M87 uh, in X-ray of iron 21 from Anderson and Sunyaev. So um, of course this uh, made like more questions around it. So. It, this is a very close by galaxy, of course. And um, yeah, like iron 21 is a tracer of this 10 to 7 gas. But we also know that like the gas in the IGM is also multi-phase. So like, how does it change where we look like further and like not necessarily very close to the galaxy itself? So is it still that hot? Is it, you know, also traced by the same line? So a lot of questions around this um, came up afterwards. So I used a very high resolution uh, quasar spectra from VLT using US, so the Eschel, um, ultraviolet and visual Eschel spectrograph. And I just like grabbed this um, spectra as an example and zoomed in of the, on the area of Lyman alpha emission. And you can see it's like a very nice, right? <laughs> For its time. And very nice, um, very high signal to noise ratio as well. So, just to explain, right? Then Lyman alpha absorbers are these um, clouds of neutral hydrogen of very high column density that can trace over densities um, in the universe, right? So we decided to use these Dem Lyman alpha absorbers as another tracer of like possible over densities and maybe these filaments as well. And um, so I had in total like 467 fully reduced continuum fitted um, spectra from a public data release. Uh, it went all the way from 2000 to 10,000 Armstrong that had already 155 DLAs in the catalog. So I said, okay, I'm gonna target this iron 21 gas and look around the area of the DLAs. And I mean around the area, of course, because the DLAs are coal gas and I'm trying to look for like, um, hotter gas and okay and I'm oh, sorry so this is just the the sample of like the Dan Lyman alpha absorbers in signal to noise ratio and um and redshift and why we while we were selecting the spectra again sadly we had to get rid of a lot of like spectra that had like problems for example gaps in the data as you can see here 
uh, in iron too, well, maybe it's a bit smaller, sorry, and, and silicon four as well, you, like you can see just like a straight line or basically just like no line already. And um, we, we did stacking. And then we did the stacking at the redshift of the DLAs, but then looking at this like specific um, line of iron 21. But we actually also looked for other metal lines <laughs> while we're at it. And uh, yeah, this is just an example of what we got when we were comparing the mean, the weighted mean, and the median. And this is an example of oxygen one. You can see the count there, it says 100. So basically just 100 stock spectra at the redshift of the DLAs show this like very deep absorption. And um, basically like why we decided to continue with the median as well is why, because it recovered better the normalization. And the mold, like the other, um, the mean and the weighted mean are mostly like more absorbed. So what we did detect, uh, we detected iron, um, carbon. You can see they're like very thin uh, and strong absorption lines. Uh, another iron, silicon, another carbon, and aluminium. Um, but uh, we did not detect like some other like weirder lines that we were also looking while we were there. And <laughs> the saddest thing is that we did not detect iron 21, right? So what can we do with that? Well, we can still say, okay, we did not detect it, but we can still measure the column density and then try to translate that into an expected column density of how much, um, the iron 21 would have to exist to be able to be detected with our current method and our current uh, instrument, right? And I'm, of course, not going to go through the formulas, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, when we uh, get the expected column density, we did need to make some assumptions. One of them was that the metallicity of the gas was solar, and the other one was that all iron was in the form of um, iron 21, which, uh, of course, we know is not 100% correct because um, this is a plot from Chianti database of the fraction of iron um, state abundances of iron. Um, versus the temperature, right? And we said that we were looking at 10 to the seven, if you can see here, 10 to the seven, <laughs> trying to point, um, iron 21, which is like between the orange and the red line, it's just one of the many ionization states of iron at this temperature. So we said, okay, we're gonna like change our assumptions. We're gonna say is 20%. And we can also like play with those numbers to see if we, you know, get anything, but, um, we decided to use, of course, like the 20% to like say, this is um, okay-ish. And with this expected column density, we said, okay, maybe with our current method and our current instrument, it's not really something that is achievable. But then we said, with future upcoming instruments, can we actually achieve this? And we chose um, this four facil uh, three facilities to compare, foremost, ELT and NSC. And, and we had like, of course, um, another equation that it depends on the spectral resolution to achieve this like signal to noise ratio in the stack that we could translate to like individual signal to noise ratio of like each of the spectra. And that again, translates into the number of spectra that we need per instrument to actually be able to detect this iron 21 in absorption. You can see foremost is like quite high. It's um, over 18 million. Uh, ELT is also like over 700,000 and MSC is over four, um, 4 million as well. So we said, okay, like realistically speaking, it's a bit far-fetched, right? But like we said, okay, out of this, actually MSC looks like, like it could be achievable maybe in a couple of years. But then Emma was mentioning as like an <laughs> instrument expert, that it could be uh, done with the ELT as well. If you choose to bin in um, spectral resolution, would you like to explain further? <laughs> yes. No, I mean, the only point is that when you are, take IRS, you have a super high spectral resolution that you actually don't need. If you just want to stack, you don't need to resolve the line. And so you just bin over spectral resolution element and if you say that you want to have uh, like a full width and maximum of 0.2 or like or something that is like, you want to drop to a, a resolution of order of 2000, 3000. 
So you can basically resolve what is the the size of these uh, pockets of gas. And so you when you go of a factor of ten less resolution, it makes us factor of square root of five or square root of five, ten less vector that you need. And so you move from seven hundred thousand to a order of like hundred thousand object. And that's if you have a multi-object spectrograph on a thirty meter telescope that can do that, will actually be achievable to detect the iron twenty one resolution. That was on that blackboard, <laughs> the whiteboard yesterday, but yeah. yeah. Now there is Maybe another Einstein here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. So thank it's, you. It's positive. We can do that. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then that was like my favorite first paper from my PhD. And you can look it up if you want, if you're interested in that, anyways. So again, going so back I have a, I have yes. a question. So just going back to the stacking method, uh -huh. um, did, did you uh, normalize by the continuum brightness or, or like when you did the weighted mean, was it unit weighted or? So it... these were already normalized spectra. So I didn't need to renormalize anything. They were already like. But so you inverse variance weight or how, how do you do the weighting for the weighted mean? The weighted mean is just the mean divided by again, like the number of like spectra used from the total. Okay, so there's there's no weighting associated with. No, no. In the end, we didn't use it. Like, okay, yeah. I'm wondering if you get different answers, like if, if you bootstrap the sample or something, so that I mean, maybe some subsample has a detection, or you get you know different properties, and so uh, sub binning, you you might get something out of that, or maybe by a different so in the end, uh, as I mentioned, we only had like 155 like DLAs from the 400 in total, so. Since we focused focus on this 100, it's not that many statistics to like be able to do much. So no, we didn't do any pinning or like, you know, or different, um, okay. yeah, sorry. Okay. But in the next one I did, so maybe I can mention that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so going back to the uh, universe composition, I told you uh, I focused on the warm hot, uh, warm, hot intergalactic medium before. And now, um, for my second project, I focused on the cold intergalactic gas. So, um, yeah, this was still done uh, at MPE, of course, with Andrea and uh, Celine. Uh, but it was like published like three weeks ago. So that's why I thought mm -hmm. that oh, I should mention like this one as well. And um, yeah, okay. So simulations also predict that there is cold gas inside uh, clusters of galaxies, right? And we have so here a snapshot of Romulus simulations. On top, we have density, temperature, and metallicity, but I wanted to focus on the, on the lower part where you have X-rays on the far left. And um, it's like a 500 parsec, oh, I don't know, maybe it's too small, but it's like 500 parsec, like this wide. And then in the middle, you have like oxygen sticks. And then on the, on the far right, you have hydrogen. And you can see that the hot gas like really tends to like stay in the middle of the cluster versus the cold gas, which seems to go like further out in radius. And this is a, a plot that actually shows the same thing. So basically uh, the gas mass fraction versus radius. And you can see the hot gas dominates in the inner uh, radius of the galaxy clusters versus um, the warm and the cold gases start getting like bigger um, towards the outside uh, outskirts of the galaxy clusters. And there were some studies that were already focused. Yes. Sorry, a quick question. So at which redshift is that? And what type of cluster is it? Is it like a relaxed cluster that's 10 to the 15 at redshift zero? Or is this is like a proto-cluster redshift? Oof, I'm sorry. Like this, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Butsky et al. 2019. That's all I can tell you. I'm sorry. Like, I don't really know. But the... really, it's like a mature cluster because you have a hot ICM. Uh, so it's kind of a, and it looks kind of spherical-ish. So it's kind of a relaxed cluster. All right. Yeah, just, just checking. Okay, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so again, as I mentioned, there were some previous studies already that were looking into um, hot gas inside galaxy clusters. But I wanted to focus on uh, the newest ones, right? So first, we have Mishra and Musahin. Uh, 2022, they used SDSS DR16 catalog and clusters from Wen and Han at 2015. So in total, they had 80,000 um, quasar cluster uh, pairs that they used, and they also did stacking. And uh, basically, so you can see those like um, two cert, um, green circles there are their magnesium two doublets, which they considered that they are blended, and then they just said 
two thirds of that corresponds to the 2796 of the magnesium and the one third to the eight, uh, 2803 line. And there's like some iron on the other side that they said that in their algorithm, they also used it as like a, a, to say, okay, this is really magnesium. And uh, so they, they did binning um, in radius. So they had like three bins and uh, with each around like 20,000 um, quasar cl uh, cluster pairs each. And these are their sum of uh, their equivalent width and their column density for, for median and mean. And uh, their mass range of their clusters is uh, 10 to 14 to, yeah, two times 10 to 14 and M500. And then we have Anand, which he actually first built a magnesium two um, catalog in uh, one million uh, of SDSS DR16 uh, quasars, and this magnesium two were along the line of sight, right? So, uh, at whichever redshift, like he found a magnesium two, like that's already like in his catalog in this one million quasar spectra. And then he used DESI uh, uh, clusters and did basically, okay, so wherever I see there's like um, a cluster, like at that redshift, if there's a magnesium to absorber, of course, like they're connected. He did the same thing with um, ELGs and LRGs. And um, yeah, this is the 2796 equivalent width versus uh, projected distance over R200, uh, R500. And the middle one is like the, the clusters. And uh, okay, so in total, he had like 71,000 um, 71, DESI clusters. And their mass range was also up to 10 to a 14. So what, uh, what I wonder was, okay, we know the simulations predicted that there was indeed coal gas inside galaxy clusters. And it has been found in clusters of like this mass. But how about bigger galaxy clusters? How about in the most massive structures? Is there still coal gas in there? And if there is, how much is there? Is there less? Is there more? Because we know that like um, the biggest galaxy clusters have a lot of coal gas, and that's why they're mostly tra traced with X-rays. So basically, I did the same method as before. I used SDSS DR16 and X-ray selected uh, clusters from ROSAT uh, satellite but with spectroscopic redshift from SPIDERS program, which is um, spectroscopic identification of Irisita sources. So Irisita is the X-ray satellite that followed up the ROSAT satellite, X-ray satellite. And, and I use magnesium too, again, as the tracer of this 10 to 4 uh, Kelvin gas, just like at the, the, previous two, um, the previous two papers I just showed. So what I did first was, okay, I want to make sure that... Um, I'm doing like the right thing and like my method works. So I also grabbed the magnesium two catalog from Anand and because they are also using the SDSS DR16, right? So I said, okay, with my clusters, is there any cross match between already the magnesium two absorption catalog from his quasars um, to mine? And we found 2000 matches. So then we cross matched it with like the location of our clusters. And this is what we found. Actually, this is a bin already. Um, that's like a very low count, but you can see the very nice magnesium two doublet there. And the two like dash lines correspond to the difference of 750 kilometers per second between the two uh, magnesium two lines. And um, basically how, um, where we like stop the measurement of the absorption. And then we did a blind stack of the full sample. Basically, we grabbed all of the spectra that we had, which was in total 16,000. And we said, I don't know if there is a magnesium two along the line of sight or not. I'm going to stack everything. And then I also removed the cross matches where I knew there was magnesium two. And then I did the same stack. And basically, it did not change at all. So this is actually the one that is like everything together, but I can like just it sounds bad to say just trust me but like when i remove like the the cross match it stays the same and uh yeah the, there's like our magnesium two doublet and also like the dash line like showing the the 750 kilometers per second separation and normalized flux and then we did do some bootstrapping um so basically i grabbed all of my sample and I scrambled the redshift of the clusters. 
and I restacked everything 500 times. So these lines in the back that, that you see in gray are actually like the result of the stacking. And um, on top, like the red one is my actual result, result of my stacking um, compared to like the other scramble redshift. And yeah, this gave us that right, my detection is like right out, like basically outlier here, um, a 3.7 sigma significance compared to the, the bootstrapping and the measurements of the equivalent width um, that were done basically saying, okay, where is like my lowest um, point in flux in absorption? And then saying, okay, what's the equivalent width curve, the, curve, the area that corresponds to that lowest point in absorption? And um, yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm gonna explain a bit more on the, how we did the measurements. We also had Mox loan spectra. So basically we had, um, we used CNG50 and we did some fake spectra where we introduced magnesium two absorbers. And this is not the one that has noise in it. I apologize, but basically a different equivalent width and a different redshift like all over the, um, the spectra. We had in total 22,000 synthetic spectra and we were comfortable with the line, spec uh, line spread function from SDSS. Uh, we added some Gaussian noise that I'm gonna like show you next to like be typical to the SDSS error. And uh, we inserted the magnesium to doublets from TNG50. And basically, come on, there. This is how it looks like. Just like a bit of noise added that didn't really show in the first plot. Right, so this is just an example of the SDSS spectrum. And um, when we did the, um, the mock spectra, we also like had to take into account that like the edges of the spectra are like more noisy as well. That's everything we accounted for and added in this like um, uh, synthetic spectra as well. Uh, okay, so this is where I did the binning. This is not in the actual like final results because when we did, uh, we did binning by mass and by um, uh, R200. So we reached up to three times R200 and we divided the mass in uh, three bins as well. And then and then we also like had like the covering fraction, right? Which is like the number of like sight lines over uh, the number of like actual quasars sight lines that are, uh, the number of sight lines with absorbers over um, the total quasar sight lines. And okay, so like here's one where uh, the angular separation is one to two times R200. And I think it's like, this is like the smallest mass that I had. And this is just another comparison here. Um, also like um, between one and two times R200 and medium medium mass in, in our sample. Uh, but don't focus too much on this. I just, I just thought it was interesting to show, but it's not really on our final results. And uh, yeah, basically <laughs> continuing with the um, uncertainty assessment using the mock uh, Sloan spectra. So we take the total magnesium per cell uh, as struck during the simulation. And then we use Cloudy again to uh, calculate the ionization states considering both photo ionization and uh, collisional ionization. And uh, we ray trace the gas as we as done in observations. Like, and this is also done with um, other um, simulations that use uh, the same method to do synthetic spectra, like Spec Wizard, Trident, and Pygot. And as I mentioned, also like we insert them at different wave, uh, at a given wavelength posi position, but different equivalent widths from 0 0.05 to 5 Armstrong. And we run the same code as our observations. And in the end, we find that only three percent of this like 22,000 synthetic spectra where um, only 3% were said, okay, this is an absorption line that could be magnesium too, but it's not really. So 3% error in, in our synthetic spectra calculations. And okay, so I said, I'm probing the most massive clusters and I'm comparing them directly to Mishra and Muzaid and Anans, which are like the first two papers that I showed that have done basically the same thing with similar data. And like my red point there is my blind detection. This is equivalent width versus column uh, and column density versus projected distance in R500. Uh, Those are the three points of um, Mishra and Muzahid in the bottom and uh, the clusters um, measurements from, from Anand. 
And I grabbed the two closest points in R500 from Anand and also the one from Mishra. And I compare them uh, versus mass, right? And this is again equivalent width. This is again column density versus mass. You can see my point is um, higher as well. It seems to be like a very nice trend of you know the mass versus the amount of uh, cold gas. But I mean, I really think we should populate this plot more before we can actually say anything, right? Because three points. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then uh, I also compare them with LRGs since um, Anand did the same thing in, on his paper. So uh, now Anand's cluster is actually in blue, sorry about that, and uh, LRGs are in, in pink, and I included one more from Lan and Mo uh, that are in, in green, and, and this is projected distance in KTC. And again, like our point, of course, is a bit higher, but uh, the LRGs from Lennon Mo seem to be like very close um, to the cluster sample from Anand. And the last thing that I did was compare it with simulations, right? So at the time, there was only TNG50 that was doing uh, groups, um, galaxies and, group and groups of galaxies. They weren't going as far out in projected distance as well, but this was the closest thing that I could get from Magnesium 2 in simulations. And again, this is our point here. And that's um, TNG basically seems to be over predicting a little the amount of cold gas. But again, like the caveats to be considered in this comparison, um, large more dif mass differences as well with um, TNG, since they are only considering CGM of galaxies and groups of galaxies. And uh, like they also probe like smaller impact parameter, but like if you see, there's like also like a trend if you go out like further. Uh, with TNG50. Um, so there's, of course, a possible disagreement between the amount of gas that the simulations are saying that there is inside um, groups of galaxies. Uh, but we would need definitely like uh, TNG clusters to come out first and then like see if they still say that there's the, like, the same amount of um, coal gas, if there's a trend. Oh, so conclusions. Um, Again, I showed this plot where I'm comparing clusters and LRGs and then groups of galaxies from TNG again up there. And just saying that uh, we do find a lot of coal gas in the massive, um, the most massive structures in the universe. And it seems to be that the bigger, the more gas, right? Which wasn't really an intuitive thing, right? Because the bigger the structures, the hotter they actually get. Um, so yeah, there's obviously some uh, work to be done on the simulations part, but I'm pretty sure we'll get that soon as well. And oops, that's sorry. <laughs> so uh, the overall conclusions um, of like the search for this diffuse gas, we did not find iron 21, but uh, yeah, we have some uh, possible um, new instruments that could, using the same technique, um, be able to find this uh, iron 2021. And uh, we do find a lot of coal gas in the most massive um, structures in the universe. And uh, it seems to be in disagreement with like current uh, simulations. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, this is the time. Questions? Yeah. I can ask one or two more, just yeah. for fun. Uh, so I'm wondering if you normalize by the total amount of gas in a cluster. So you say you have this trend of uh, increasing amount of cold gas with increasing cluster mass, but there's also going to be more hot gas, right? And yeah. so I'm wondering if the fractional amount of gas in the cold phase increases as you get to higher mass clusters? That's a great question, actually. Um, we did not do that, so, but, but it would be super interesting to do that. Actually. Does it, is it like a one-to-one -one trend in terms of the column density that you measure versus the cluster mass? Because everything being equal, the amount of uh, gas in the, uh, encased in the hot ICM should scale proportionally with the cluster mass. We cannot say that. We cannot say that for sure, uh, but yeah, we. I mean, we could estimate saying like, it looks like it could be, one to one, but we cannot say that. Okay. Yeah. Because you could measure that, but like assuming hydrodynamical equilibrium, you could measure it from the X-ray detection 
the row set detection or the Rosita detection and then see uh, if the fractional amount is is, is different. Follow up for my project. Thank you. <laughs> um, then also about the TNG uh, 50 results, kind of the same question. I mean, so, you know, in groups, the, the gas is typically going to be uh, less hot. So you would expect fractionally more cold gas. But did you try normalizing or anything like that to just kind of see? Because you kind of expect that the trend is going to be higher. And then in TNG 300, you could do the same experiment and uh, where there's more massive clusters um, and, and see if you, if you see something. So TNG 300 didn't have any um, cold magnesium to yet in in their simulations. That's why we didn't okay. include it. Yeah. You drop the resolution, it's a mess. Mm -hmm. That's the compromise, no? The, all the CGM size is done in TNG 50 uh, because you have that. enough particle resolution mm -hmm. to actually start to resolve something. TNG 500 or 300. 300. 300. Then there's TNG cluster, which I'm not sure is out yet. Is it? No, yeah. I'm not, I'm not yeah. exactly. But you, you have to compromise with the resolution. And so it's like, it's, you, you start, yeah, then you don't believe your simulation anymore at this scale with this amount of cold gas in there because it's like one blob. So conversely, you could, I mean, SDSS has groups. And so you could do the same experiment with groups. So you can match the TNG 50. Yeah, actually, yeah. And one other question. <laughs> uh, uh, could, what's the hope of doing this at higher redshift? So, uh, um, I mean, you would expect the, the fractional amount of cold gas for a given cluster mass to increase with uh, increasing redshift. Could you do this at redshift one, two? I mean, three? if we have the data, then why not? But I'm actually not working with this anymore. So like, um, since I, I moved to uh, Bilan and Bicoca, I changed professors like um, once. So first I was working with Pumagali, and now I'm working with Cantalugo. And he's mostly doing a Lyman Alpha emission in um, uh, Nebula. And, and now I'm actually doing the same. So kind of like deviating, but it could be like a side project. So yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> How many groups did we know at Irish ship? What's high redshift for you? <laughs> <laughs> Above one. I could give you 500. Wow. Groups. Yeah. How many groups in the background quizzer you have? That would be your job. <laughs> <laughs> they're all in Cosmos? No, they're all in the sky. Because they are uh, in Northern Hemisphere, mostly. The magnesium to enter in the optical uh, above redshift 1.4. Yeah, so 1.4, 1.5 is tough. But I mean, proto clusters are redshift too. I mean, where the lemon alpha nebula are potentially preferentially located, uh, then you can start to do lemon alpha absorption. So there's a whole project uh, about that. Um, that we can talk about some of it. Okay, I'll give up the phone. Yes, I have a very basic question. It might be very, very basic, but I'm not very used to this absorption in yeah. spectroscopy study. So why is magnesium 2 used as a tracer for this, or has been found as a tracer for the neutral gas? Could there be other tracers as well, or is it just a very prominent one that's easy to observe? <laughs> I mean, it's easy to observe because it's like a, a doublet, right? So that's why mostly it's like used for these effects. But it, I mean, for me, it was... Um, very uh, an awkward encounter with Misha and Muzahid because they literally use the same data and they have more. But when they do their binning, it's actually what I'm doing as well. The, the stacking, I did stacking of 16,000, they did stacking of 20,000, a different um, radius. And they have like this blended thing uh, versus like what I just showed you. Um, it looks very nice doublet. So. I'm not really, uh, I'm not really familiar with like other, uh, I think, uh, isn't it C4 also used like as a tracer? Yeah. But like, I know magnesium two is used because of like, it's very nice doublet shape and it's easy to track. And it's in SDS S spectra, for example. So it's also the spectral range. Yes. Then, yes, exactly. So, so it's fair to say that so far, this is the only real tracer seen for these galaxy cluster studies. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From all the, the studies that I mentioned, like they mostly, yeah, they all used magnesium too, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My question, you can do actually mm -hmm. this similar experiment with C4 at slightly higher version. So you probably have less 
object, less clusters. The C4 trace a slightly warmer gas and more methane enriched. So maybe that's the next potential thing. So do you, when you do the stacking at the end, you have for free all the metal subsolvents, no? You just stack everything together. Yeah. Now you focus here, but on the other side, you have Byron. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you happen to check those? Do you see anything or? I didn't check. I mean, we could check, of course, but like for this specific study, we did not. Yeah. More questions? From people online? I have a question on the first part of the talk. <laughs> you want me to go back? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is is there still uh, the only detection in the mission of iron twenty one is the only one that is associated with Andromeda? Or is there any new M eighty seven? M eighty seven. Sorry. Um. So there were a few that claimed to have found not with uh, iron twenty one, like from Nicastro, mm -hmm. and uh. Well, that was uh really not a hundred percent with the entire community uh, of his detection, but it wasn't iron, it was oxygen. I'm going to make up some, like, I, I don't know which one. Yeah. So there are? There are others. Growing. Like, yeah. yeah. If there is no more question, let's thank you. Yeah, she will be in my office until Friday. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>